Nuclear Hot Seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear Hot Seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear Hot Seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear Hot Seat, it's the bomb. Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, I join Kimberly Roberson in talking about food and radiation issues, as well as a new program we've created to share this information with community, primarily people outside the existing anti-nuclear community. Kimberly is founder of Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network and has anti-nuclear credits going back decades, as well as professional certification as a nutrition educator. So her observations are sharp, clear, and important. Plus, as always, we've got your numbnuts of the week, your activist shout-out, the Get Me on John Stewart as his nuclear pundit campaign, Tweet the Pope, and enough nuclear information to choke a Kardashian. All coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, January 13, 2015, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. At Fukushima, the density of all beta nuclides, including cesium-134, cesium-137, and strontium-90, have been shown to be rapidly increasing in the groundwater. This according to Tokyo Electric Power Company, TEPCO. The most recent sample was taken in the seaside of Reactor 2 on January 12th of this year. Compared to the previous measurement taken only four days before, Cesium-134 and 137 density rose up to 57 times. All beta nuclide density also rose up 57 times. This is the highest reading yet measured from this site. TEPCO, of course, per usual, hasn't been able to identify the reason. And theoretically, it is natural to assume the high level of contamination is flowing into the Pacific Ocean without anything to stop it. No surprises here, because the outright failures in systems continue to plague the Fukushima facility. On December 14th, Dr. Steve Elwart, a professional engineer and expert for the Department of Homeland Security, said, With most of the media silent about the cleanup, the public may think the worst is over at Fukushima Daiichi. Nothing could be further from the truth. Radioactive water is leaking out into the ocean, allowing it to spread around the world through ocean currents, and this has prompted grave concerns over the impact on sea life in the area and around the world. On December 26th, TEPCO indicated that a new method aimed at tackling a large volume of highly radioactive wastewater at the nuclear power facility, has not been entirely successful. Talk about your understatement. Last month, the utility began pouring cement into underground tunnels filled with contaminated water from the reactor buildings to stop the water inflow. But the water is believed to be leaking into the Pacific Ocean just the same, because officials said that when they pumped water up from one of the pits... The water level at another pit changed, and this suggests that gaps exist in the concrete-filled tunnels. And we all know that the ice wall was a total failure. As regards the concept that if you dilute radiation enough, it will be safe, and that what's the big deal about putting it in the Pacific Ocean because the ocean is so big it makes no difference, Dr. Alice Stewart, who is a physician and epidemiologist, said... Dilute it, and it will add to the dangers. Jan van de Poot, radiation safety specialist, said, Radiation is inducing health damage regardless of how little the doses are. If you dilute radiation, all the health effects will only be more widely distributed. 
This is the only effect of this dilution philosophy. And there will be more about low-level radiation in the activist shout-out today. As regards the release of radionuclides into the Pacific Ocean, a paper submitted to the Society for Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry, written by Dr. Juan Jose Alava and Dr. Frank Gobas, both of Simon Fraser University, stated, The Fukushima nuclear accident emerged as a global threat to the conservation of the Pacific Ocean, human health, and marine biodiversity. A major release of radioactive material with widespread health and environmental effects requiring implementation of planned and extended countermeasures has received scant attention and inadequate radiation monitoring. The potential radioactive contamination of seafoods through bioaccumulation of radioisotopes in marine and coastal food webs are issues of major concern for the public health of coastal communities. Cesium-137 can be expected to bioaccumulate gradually over time in the food web. Bioaccumulation was characterized by slow uptake and elimination rates in upper tropic levels, meaning a higher placement on the food chain. The paper states that magnification of this radionuclide takes place in the marine food web over time. There was work done to model the bioaccumulation of cesium-137 in an offshore food web of the Pacific Northwest, and it stated that Pacific salmon species are likely to deliver Fukushima-associated radioactive cesium-137 to the resident killer whales food web in the waters off the Pacific Northwest. It also pointed out that there would be uptake of cesium-137 in human populations that consume sea products. Here's a fun one. There have been a record level of flesh-eating bacteria cases in Japan, and the spike began around 2011, which, of course, is when the Fukushima disaster began. Before 2011, an average of 60 to 70 cases were reported annually. In 2011, that rose to 143 cases. In 2012, 242. And in 2014, a record high 263 patients were found to be suffering from streptococcal toxic shock-like syndrome, a deadly infection otherwise known as flesh-eating bacteria. And an interesting statement by the U.S. Department of Defense, this from 2012, Concerns about nuclear disasters have shifted to emphasize the low-dose acute and low-dose rate chronic irradiation scenarios of nuclear accidents. Non-lethal doses of ionizing radiation enhance susceptibility to exogenous, meaning external, bacterial infections. Immune responses are greatly diminished within a few days after irradiation. Individuals should be monitored continually for symptoms of infection, which are difficult to treat effectively in those who receive whole-body ionizing radiation. Would that they would apply all of that to the sailors of the USS Reagan, who were hit with high levels of radiation from the plume of Fukushima while on an humanitarian aid issue in the days immediately following the earthquake, tsunami, and start of the nuclear disaster. And now... Nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, none that's out of week. Thanks to Fukushima Diary for this tasty tidbit. On Friday, the 9th of January, Panasonic announced they are going to reuse a Fukushima factory as a vegetable plant. The Fukushima factory used to manufacture digital cameras, but seeing that that particular technology died in the age of smartphones, Panasonic decided to be subsidized by the Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry to support the restoration of Fukushima by reusing the factory as a vegetable plant. That just sounds redundant, vegetable plant. Panasonic cites the lighting and air conditioning already in place for the effective and efficient cultivation of vegetables. They plan to produce highly modified plants 
Highly modified, as in GMOs? Doesn't say here. They plan to produce highly modified plants, such as, dig it, low potassium lettuce for kidney disease. And you can catch kidney disease, such as kidney cancer, by exposure to radiation, which could come from the Fukushima-based vegetable plant. Now, radioactive contamination is never mentioned in the announcement by Panasonic. Of course not. I'm surprised they didn't go into a lecture about the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, just to prove how patriotic they're being. And it is not known what kind of radiation testing, if any, will be applied to the bright, 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 possibly glowing in the dark, green, leafy vegetables of the plant plant. And that's why Panasonic is this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of week. Today, January 13, in Japan, a second criminal complaint has been filed against a former nuclear safety official and eight others, arguing that they failed to take necessary preventive measures in the Fukushima nuclear crisis. A complaint filed in June of 2012 named TEPCO's then-chairman Tsunehisa Katsumata and others for causing the 2011 disaster at TEPCO's Fukushima Daiichi nuclear facility. The accused this time include Yoshinori Moriyama, a former official in charge of nuclear disaster countermeasures at the now-defunct Nuclear and Industrial Safety Agency, and others, including TEPCO officials. The complainants comprise a range of people, including some residents of Fukushima Prefecture. Their written complaint filed with the Tokyo District Public Prosecutor's Office, accuses the nine of responsibility for people being exposed to radiation because they failed to take countermeasures for possible severe accidents. Meanwhile, the prosecutor's office is reinvestigating the first case after an independent judicial panel of citizens ruled last year that Katsumata and two other TEPCO officials merit indictment, despite a decision by prosecutors not to indict them. Go get them. And in a little bit of good news, five aging nuclear reactors in Japan will be decommissioned in the near future. Legal changes in the wake of the accident at Fukushima Daiichi limited nuclear reactors to a 40-year operating life. Would that that were the case here in the United States. Utilities will be given a one-time extension of up to 20 years if a reactor meets new, tougher safety standards, which, of course, will cost the operators a lot of money. And that is why, at the Genkai No. 1 nuclear reactor in Saga Prefecture, which is operated by Kyushu Electric, officials have decided to decommission the 40-year-old reactor rather than carry out expensive work to meet the safety standards. Six other reactors are nearing or past the 40-year limit. Kansai Electric is expected to decommission the number one and number two reactors at its Nahama plant, while Chugo Electric plans to decommission the Shimane number one reactor. And Japan Atomic Power had decided to decommission its Tsuruga number one reactor in Fukui Prefecture even before the Fukushima nuclear accident, because that reactor is now in its 44th year of operation. The reactor will stop operations sometime in 2016 and begin being decommissioned. Here in the U.S., there has been a cataclysmic die-off of birds on the entire West Coast, with the epicenter in Oregon. The die-off of birds is up to 100 times greater than the normal annual death rates, and many beaches are literally covered in dead birds. Professor Julia Parrish of the University of Washington School of Aquatic and Fishery Science said on January 6th, we're working with oceanographers and atmospheric scientists to try and discover whether there's something in the environment which is signaling a difference, signaling a change. Don't you just love experts? They're the last people to use the F word. Fukushima. Also in the U.S., thyroid cancer numbers are increasing. Thyroid cancer is known to occur after exposure to high levels of radiation. 
Examples of high levels of radiation include fallout from such sources as nuclear power plant accidents or weapons testing. Still, doctors from the Mayo Clinic staff say that they aren't sure what causes most cases of thyroid cancer, so there's no way to prevent it in people who have an average risk of the disease. Last week, Johns Hopkins said that cancer was a fluke and getting it was like losing the genetic lottery. And now these doctors say that they don't know what causes it. Can we have a collective duh here? So while the experts who are doctors claim to have no idea what's causing the cancer risks, there's been no objection to President Obama and the Environmental Protection Agency recently approving dramatically raising permissible radioactive levels in drinking water and soil following radiological incidents such as nuclear power plant accidents and dirty bombs. The nuclear industry calls this their new normal, but normal's just the middle of a graph and there is nothing normal, humane, or decent about this. Still, according to Public Employees for Environmental Responsibility, That's what they're calling it. Pay no attention to that nuclear disaster behind the curtain. It's not impacting your health at all. The EPA has issued radiation guides called Protective Action Guides, or PAGs, which allow more radiation than any American has ever been exposed to. U.S. government's PAGs allow long-term public exposure to radiation in amounts as high as 2,000 millirems. This would, in effect, increase a long-standing 1 in 10,000 person cancer rate to a 1 in 23 persons cancer rate when exposed over a 30-year period. Many experts are expecting elevated cancer rates due to these allowable, though not by anybody sane that I know, allowable levels of radiation exposure. The PAGs are the work of Gina McCarthy, infamous for being in charge of the RADnet program, which was mostly inoperable when Fukushima happened, and that's why we don't have any reliable readings at all. According to Peer Executive Director Jeff Rush, this is a public health policy only Dr. Strangelove could embrace. Back in 2012, operators at the Savannah River site improperly diverted nearly a quarter of a million dollars away from an effort to clean up atomic waste and towards a campaign to develop mini nuclear reactors at the weapons complex near Aiken, South Carolina. Clean up the mess created by old nukes, build new nukes to come up with more mess. Hey, at SRS, they can't tell the difference. Fortunately, the watchdog group Savannah River site did see the difference and call them on it publicly. Here's a good one. Last May, the Illinois legislature responded to months of mounting hysteria from Exelon Corporation that several of the utilities reactors in the state were losing money and might be forced to close. So the legislature passed H.R. 1146, which directed four state agencies to examine Exelon's claims with a clear intent to support the utility. In October, the Nuclear Energy Institute released a study meant to bolster Exelon's position. Well, on January 7th, the agencies released their report and concluded that Illinois would get by just fine if all of Exelon's uneconomic reactors were to close. Even worse for Exelon, the report said that shutting down the reactors, quote, could even bolster clean energy generation and jobs, end quote. I just love it. We'll have the week's interview in just a moment, but first, it's official! Thanks to the generosity of Nuclear Hot Seat listeners, I am going to Dr. Caldicott's Symposium on the Dynamics of Possible Nuclear Extinction. I don't know many people who would be this excited about going to an event with a title like that, but I sure am. This will allow me to bring you interviews with participants and activists from around the world and get you up close and personal with the excitement, the strategizing, the brain trust, and the camaraderie of our community as we come together in an international anti-nuclear critical mass. 
Thanks to the generosity of Nuclear Hot Seat listeners, I have thus far been able to cover airfare, it is booked, and housing. That's just about covered. But I still need to be able to cover ground transportation and, oh yes, meals while I'm there. It would be helpful if I could eat. Real food, mostly vegetables, not a lot. So I invite you to contribute to helping me bring the excitement of this important symposium into the electronic device of your choice. You can do so by going to NuclearHotSeat.com and scrolling down on the homepage to the big red donate button. Any amount is welcomed, and my gratitude to all of you who decide to come forward and help. For this week's interview, I'm very excited to share with you about a program I've been putting together with Kimberly Roberson. Now, Kim is a certified nutrition educator, the founder of Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network, and the author of Silence Deafening, Fukushima Fallout, A Mother's Response. I've mentioned our work together in passing on this show and also through social media posts. Kim and I previously discussed this project as part of a full-length interview on Project Censored, a nationally syndicated broadcast program that specializes in the news that didn't make the news. This week, Kimberly and I will share with you about food safety issues and break out the information on how this new program called RAPT, which stands for Radiation Awareness Protection Talk, can be accessed. Kimberly. Thanks for joining me. Well, thanks, Libby. It's great to be here, and I am a huge fan of Nuclear Hot Seat, so thanks for everything you're doing. You're welcome. You know, I lived through the anti-Russian nuclear propaganda of the 1950s Cold War. That was when we were told the truth about radiation's dangers because it was going to be coming from the Russians, and the Russians were bad. Then in 1979... I experienced the terror firsthand of being only one mile from the Three Mile Island nuclear accident as it was unfolding. So when Fukushima and the nuclear disaster there began on March 11 of 2011, I was already sensitized to the dangers of nuclear. I knew that as terrible as the earthquake and tsunami had been, the impact of nuclear radiation on health and life would be even more devastating and long-lasting. Food and water safety came immediately to mind. Now, I had not been an activist on the issue at that point, so I didn't know anyone else even thinking about that ongoing problem. And that's why, less than one month after Fukushima began, I was surprised and relieved to encounter a lengthy Facebook post by someone writing clearly and powerfully about the dangers posed to the food chain and our water supply. That post was written by you, Kimberly Roberson and was the start of a relationship that led to us creating the RAPT program. So first, I want to explore what brought you to such an immediate awareness of the food safety issue after Fukushima and motivated you to write that first Facebook post. Well, everything was really converging in that moment when I learned on March 11th of 2011 what was happening in Japan because I have a background in both anti-nuclear activism and holistic nutrition. So when Fukushima started, I began to connect the dots pretty quickly, as you can imagine. And back in the 90s, I was part of the Ward Valley Coalition, and that was a very united a powerful group that fought and defeated the proposed low-level radioactive dump in Southern California, which happened to be above an underground aquifer adjacent to the Colorado River, unlined trenches for so-called low-level radioactive waste. And this water system is part of much of the drinking and agricultural water for the western United States. So all of us in the coalition got a first-hand education on what so-called low-level radiation really is and that it is far from harmless, especially for kids and pregnant and nursing moms. When they told us not to worry about Fukushima, I didn't listen. And when they said mostly nothing at all, the silence was truly deafening. I had always planned on returning to work in the nutrition field after my son started back to school, but Fukushima made me doubt that that could ever happen. And the more I found out about the problem, the more I knew in my heart that it wouldn't be possible to counsel someone on the merits of eating, say, an organic diet, understanding now that even foods thought to be the healthiest, like organic and others, 
can potentially be contaminated with radioactive fallout from Fukushima. So this really sacred system of belief that I have was seriously threatened. And not only did I mourn what was happening to the planet and its inhabitants, but also what I thought was the loss of a profession that I really treasured. And after 10 years of working in that profession, there was a lot of mourning there. So I tried to turn that around as best as I could into proactive work. You also wrote a book that touches on these issues from a personal perspective. Yes, I did, but, you know, I never intended to write a book. It never even crossed my mind. It kind of grew somewhat organically. Someone said that once to me, and it really stuck in my mind. I was asked to write an article about the first food monitoring petition that I wrote back on April 1st of 2011, and that was how you and I met, Libby. You read the article online. It was on Dr. Helen Caldicott's Nuclear Free Planet website, and you wrote in the comments section that you thought it would be a good ebook. And I remember thinking, well, that's really nice that she thinks that, but no way. I'm not, I can't do that. But it stuck in my mind, you know, as those things do. And once the ebook was completed, someone else asked for it to be in a print edition. They could actually have a book to hold. And then it was published with Vision Talk. So the whole process really took on a life of its own, and it was reissued as a second edition, and it will probably go into a third run as well. But I've always really considered it like it had a life of its own. I was just the conduit for the information. And the book is actually a, a diary of events as they unfolded around Fukushima in 2011 and 2012. The deafening silence that to this day on many levels surrounds this issue And it's also a call to action to everyone, but especially to parents and grandparents who are unfamiliar or outright misguided about nuclear power's effects on human health and future generations. What led you to found FAN, Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network, and what is the stated purpose of the group? Who is it for? Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network formed around that first food monitoring petition I mentioned, And thanks to the encouragement of some trusted friends, I felt empowered to contact some of the people I used to work with and really admired. It was always with the people that I just really, really enjoyed working with in the past and kind of considered them to be like a dream team. And But all the time that I was doing that, I was in the, always in the back of my mind that a major group would come along and take this on, like an established national group. And it to date hasn't happened. No matter how important this is, you know, Let's make no mistake about it. This is really another way of internal contamination to our bodies. You know, this is internal exposure via food consumption, food and water. And internal contamination was, without without a doubt, the most harmful type of exposure to radiation. Internal contamination is, without a doubt, the most harmful type of exposure to radiation. It's cumulative and it's extremely destructive. It's a real complex issue. It's an elephant in the room that groups really weren't and still aren't ready to deal with head on. So that's one piece of it that I feel significant to mention. You know, we just, it was kind of like necessity being the mother of invention. And I kept hearing from well-established groups that they didn't have the bandwidth. I heard that word a lot. They had their own agendas and boards and budgets. And to be fair, this is a world where we have so many extremely difficult challenges already, the climate change, the GMO, and many others. So we were able still to to pull together a group of pretty, I would say, very impressive people. And our mission is simply to protect and improve the food and water quality in the United States due to the Fukushima disaster and to work with people in Japan to help them as well. Tell us about the petition Singh put out. The petition was filed with the United States Food and Drug Administration back on March 12th of 2013, and it calls for a significant reduction in the current allowable levels of cesium-134 and 137 in food, nutritional supplements, and pharmaceuticals. Currently, the U.S. has the highest allowable levels for radioactive cesium in the world, and basically what it boils down to is that it's a huge loophole that has never been addressed before. Some people think that the FDA raised allowable levels after Fukushima started, but that's not true. That was EPA and water. What FDA has done, they established such an incredibly high level to begin with that it didn't need to be raised. That level is 1,200 becquerel per kilogram. Now, a becquerel is one atomic disintegration per second. A kilogram is roughly two and a half pounds of food, say in this case spinach. 
1,200 becquerel per kilogram of cesium-134 and 137 of food in the U.S., as opposed to 100 becquerel per kilogram of cesium in food in Japan, which is still enough to qualify it as nuclear waste. FAN is the only group currently working to improve food policy in the U.S. due to Fukushima and man-made radiation in our food supply. And I wanted to mention, too, that the cesium-134 and 137 are two radionuclides that indicate that many others are present. So even though it seems like there's, it's only testing for two, it's like the canary in a coal mine. Where there's one even, there are many, many others. I also wanted to be sure to mention that there's a signing petition to the FDA comment petition also. Both of our petitions are at www.ffan.us. The citizen petition is for commenting. It takes a few minutes to do. The signing petition takes just a few seconds. And, of course, I will have links up on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 186. Now, I want to let listeners know that, Kim, you became an early interviewee for Nuclear Hot Seat and have been a recurring guest, as well as a source for background information every time an issue came up dealing with food safety. I would call you, discuss the information I found online, and work with you to figure out whether it was reliable or not before passing it along as part of the program. It's just the level of research that I do. So from the beginning, both you and I shared a proactive approach to taking care of our health, despite contradictions from others who said there was nothing that could be done. So Kim, as a nutrition educator, so Kim, as a certified nutrition educator, What do you say to those who maintain that there is no way to protect from radiation and that it's counterproductive to our movement to tell people that it is possible? Well, you know, Libby, that's a great question. A lot of this information has been coming out due to our research and others, too, and it wasn't really readily apparent back in March of 2011 what could be done. But in the years that have followed, we realized that there has been a lot of research by Bandashevsky, Yablokov, and others about the effects of radiation on human health and our food. So learning that has been very empowering. And all along, I felt that it's just going to be one step at a time, even from the early days where I was the lady in the store, you know, looking for anything predated March of 2011. You know, a little voice in my head just said, look, just keep trying one day at a time, more will be revealed. And it's really a quality of life issue. And I've been inspired by history and situations where people organized and survived in really daunting situations. To not be afraid of the truth, to not be afraid to fight, and to work for for what's best. And in a sense, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Fukushima has opened up a huge kind of Pandora's box on what the nuclear industry has been doing to our food and water around the globe. As a parent, there was no way I was capable of accepting that we can't do better for our kids and ourselves. We're responsible for children. We need to work hard to find ways to keep them as healthy as possible. And don't forget that this radioactivity is transgenerational DNA damage causing. It doesn't just affect one child going down the ancestral line. It's the child's child and the child's child's child. It goes on for generations. Dr. Ridley Bertel wrote extensively about that. What are some steps that we can take? There are some obvious things to do, like filtering our water, but some others aren't so obvious. For instance, edible clays and zeolite have been used for thousands of years by people to feel healthy, to feel better, to have more stamina, without really understanding, of course, what the scientific reasons were for that happening. But now we know why they work. Again, Bandashevsky and Yablokov, we know that there were things that they discovered through their research that significantly helped people. One example, in the Belarus region, during and after the Chernobyl nuclear crisis, which actually I shouldn't say after, it's ongoing as well. That's where they used zeolite, both in capsule form for the liquidators and also baked into cookies for the children. Another example is lessons learned as far back as Nagasaki, where after that horrific bomb blast, people who survived that were under the care of a doctor 
about uh, 25 kilometers away. I can't remember exactly. I write about it in the book. And it was at St. Francis Hospital, and he was able to keep every patient in the hospital healthy, away from radiation poisoning. No one had radiation poisoning if they avoided sugar and ate a macrobiotic diet. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. So there are things that people can do. And as I explained in Silence Deafening, it's not enough to just take care of ourselves and our own families. Change has to happen with how we create energy in our world so that there are no more Fukushimas. I mean, we have to transition as soon as possible to safe energy sources. Some say we've passed the tipping point and others disagree with that. But no matter how you look at it, it isn't just enough to take care of ourselves. We have to fully transition as soon as possible to renewable energy. Very well said, Kim. And it was our shared concern that led us to create a program that we call RAPT, which stands for Radiation Awareness Protection Talk. I found that there's a lot of fear and confusion in the general population about food safety, supplementation, and just generally how to take care of one's health in the face of the threat of radiation from Fukushima and elsewhere. From the start on Nuclear Hot Seat, I included radiation protection tips and interviews with people such as yourself who focused on food safety issues. I'm a good researcher online, and I did have the thought of compiling that information into a book or a seminar-type program, only, quite frankly, I didn't have a nutritionist's credential to support what my research was showing. And during that time, the first three years after Fukushima started, I compiled as much information as possible. And when it became clear that the situation was getting worse with no end in sight, and that the process of changing policy in the United States was going to take longer than I had hoped, working through agencies. I actually had to start looking at what I could best do in, in the moment, and I started a master list of the most proven proactive measures for helping to best guard our health against the effects of radiation. And we all know that in addition to radiation, there are many other food issues, including toxins, pesticides, GMOs, a lot of people are realizing now about the spraying that happens with chemtrails, and the heavy metals involved in that. So many of these issues can be addressed simultaneously by taking the steps that we outline in the RAPT program. What are the top three points you think people need to understand to get a handle on the magnitude of the problem we face regarding radiation and the food supply and the need to take steps to further protect ourselves? Three things. One, we must close the radioactive loophole that I mentioned earlier here in the U.S. by significantly lowering all the levels of radioactive cesium and other radionuclides in our food supply. Number two, understand that once it's in the food chain, it's there for millions of years. So we must adapt to this new understanding, and we do that by educating ourselves as best as possible and not being afraid, not turning a blind eye. Number three, ingesting radionuclides can lead to transgenerational DNA damage, infertility, birth defects, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and more. So we need to take it on with clarity and with honesty and not be afraid. In addition, it's not just Fukushima that exposes us to the dangers of nuclear radiation. If you live within 50 miles of a functioning nuclear reactor or decommissioned nuclear reactor even, which stores a vast amount of radioactive waste on site, you are at danger of exposure. If you live near any site used in the development of the atom bombs used at Hiroshima or Nagasaki, all of which still store radioactive waste on site. If you're near uranium mines, whether they are in active use or not, because the tailings are stored around, which are radioactive, and dust can be picked up and blown great distances. And then there are rainouts of radiation from the jet stream, which still contains radioactive particles from all the atmospheric tests and explosions that have ever taken place, and that includes the explosion that took place at Fukushima. So while some areas may be marginally better than others, to be honest, we are all at some degree of risk from exposure to radiation. Now, around the third anniversary of Fukushima, Kim and I, you and I, decided to turn what we were learning for ourselves into a program that we could provide as a service to others so that the best quality information we had discovered 
could be made available to the community and beyond. So we created the Radiation Awareness Protection Talk Program. In Wrapped, we created three audios, approximately one hour each, that cover conscious food choices, foods to avoid, and those that help support our immune system best. Supplementation, detoxification, and healthy immune support. Water and air purification. How to deal with gardens, pets, and general nuclear home hygiene. How to take the best possible care of your living environment. And recommended products, including a specific purified liquid zeolite that we have determined is the best quality available on the market and the, by far the most effective. That's what we have available in the first three audios. And in addition, RAFT comes with three bonus audios, which are an explanation of what radiation is and why it's so dangerous to our health, what to do in case of a nuclear emergency, and how to get information on food source safely directly from manufacturers with a full script to follow. So you might ask, who is the RAP, the Radiation Awareness Protection Talk Program for? RAP is intended primarily for those who know enough to be concerned but do not yet have a clear understanding of what they can do to protect their health. The RAP program will also prove useful to those who may have already researched for themselves and are always looking to expand their information base. Now, if you're someone who's already working in this movement, some of this information will be known to you. Or if you want to find it, you know where to look and who to trust. And I want to make this clear, you are not our intended audience. Though, of course, everyone can benefit from what we have provided. But there are people who know nothing of how to protect themselves. They don't even know that they need to protect themselves and their families. They don't know where to look. And they want the information from a source that they can trust where there is such a glut of free information available on the Internet. Very good points, Lady. And also mothers and fathers, women who are pregnant or want to become pregnant, mothers who are nursing, those who are compromised with immune system difficulties or chronic diseases, And, of course, the elderly. They're so overlooked in our society. They're such valuable family members and parts of our community, and they're more susceptible to radiation dangers as well. And also health professionals who have been avoiding the issue out of confusion or fear or just not knowing about it at all. RAPT can help them adjust key protocols for health so that the very best information is made available to their patients and clients. And, again, I did not know personally how I would ever be able to continue working in the field of nutrition knowing what Fukushima was doing to our food supply. But with RAPT, there are some very basic plans that will enhance any client or patient protocol. So if you are a health professional, be it holistic or allopathic, please feel free to contact us for more information, and we'll tell you how in a few minutes. The question then comes up, why trust us? Why trust you and me? as the source of this information. As a nutrition educator, I have been working in the field for many, many years. Prior to Fukushima, I first worked on anti-nuclear and other environmental issues beginning in 1989. I started young, (laughs) then in the field of nutrition from 1998 to 2008 when I took a break to become a stay-at-home mom. But I still worked very extensively on, on understanding what was happening with Fukushima. Before, I specialized primarily in detoxification and addiction recovery and have worked at several Bay Area recovery clinics and hospitals, including Haight-Ashbury Free Clinic, the Henry Olaf Programs, Bayside Marin, and Mount St. Joseph St. Elizabeth Hospital's Epiphany House. And I've also been active in lobbying in D.C. and Sacramento for both natural health and environmental issues. So... I bring this experience to the detailed work that I'm doing now. I understand how important it is to get it right and to be as clear and concise and accurate as possible. And my background is as a journalist and researcher, and I bring to the table what I've learned from producing over 185 episodes. It's hard to believe it's that many, but 185 episodes of Nuclear Hot Seat. What I learned about and began doing for myself and my health after Three Mile Island, which may be the reason I'm still alive today. Now, woven into RAP is information about the entire nuclear situation, 
So especially for people who aren't familiar with the kind of political background we're dealing with, it has the potential to motivate others to join our movement. There's an old saying from the 60s and 70s, the personal is the political, and nothing is more personal than our help. So perhaps RAP can motivate people to join us in our efforts. Plus, there are people who do not trust what is available on the Internet for free and feel better about purchasing a product where there is a known responsible source behind it to take accountability for what's there. Now, Wrapped is put together in the style of training offered in the seminar world. There are three one-hour-long audios and three bonus audios. Plus, we're going to be providing regular follow-up email with the most cutting-edge information that we discover. And this is available to anyone who signs up for the Raft program. For people who are used to buying training seminars and programs, our price is extremely reasonable. It's under $100. So if you are interested, check out Raft Radiation Awareness Protection Talk. We have a website for you to visit, and there's a free special report there. It's entitled, Seven Misconceptions About Radiation and Immune System Risks and the Number One Way to Help Protect the Health of You and Your Loved Ones. You can get it by going to www.raptawareness.com. And if you want to contact us directly, the email is aware at raptawareness.com. And while you're on the site, visit our store. We don't promote a lot of products, but we found that some pass our vetting and we've determined are the best quality currently available on the market. That's not to say that there aren't other products out there that others may support, but these are the ones that we are not only recommending, but that we ourselves use. Kim, I want to thank you for being here. Kimberly Roberson is the founder of Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network, the author of Silent Deafening, Fukushima Fallout, A Mother's Response, and the co-creator of Radiation Awareness Protection Talk. I appreciate you joining me and us this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you, Libby. That was Kimberly Roberson of Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network, the author of Silent Deafening, Fukushima Fallout, A Mother's Response, and my partner in Radiation Awareness and Protection Talk. We have a free report on the food safety issue up on the RAPT website, which is raptawareness.com. And if you want a shortcut to get there, go to Nuclear Hot Seat, where there is a button that looks exactly like the Wrapped logo up on the home page and under this episode, number 186. Also, there's a button to click if you want to learn more about the purified liquid zeolite product we mentioned. Finally, I will be posting a link to the Project Censored interview, which was broadcast in 20 different markets around the country and now lives online forever. Activist shout-out. Last December, Nuclear Hot Seat reported on a proposed bill by Illinois Republican Representative Randy Hultgren of the 14th District that proposed the Low-Dose Radiation Research Act of 2015. As of January 7th, this bill passed the House, though it does not yet have a sponsor in the Senate. There's been quite a lot of talk about this on certain activist email channels, and it's clear that we all need our activist radar out and start taking steps regarding this bill. Among other things, it seeks to, quote, enhance the scientific understanding of and reduce uncertainties associated with the effects of exposure to low-dose radiation in order to inform improved risk management methods. Well, shoot, we had this all figured out in the Beer 7 report, Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation. But now, as the manufactured buzz is going, and this is a quote from biophysicist David Brenner, director of Columbia University's Center for Radiological Research, Some scientists have proposed that there is a threshold level below which exposure to radiation is not dangerous, but there is no consensus as to whether such a threshold exists or what the safe exposure level would be. Others, including radiobiologist William Morgan, who is director of radiation biology and biophysics at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in Richland, Washington, Richland being the town that hosts the Hanford site, Morgan says, 
Some say it is good for you. Others say it has no effect. And the rest think it's terrible for you. Herein lies the confusion in the low-dose radiation field, he says. No confusion there in the activist world. This is a full frontal attack on Beer 7. Which is why, from the many activist responses that were posted within this online community, I want to quote from the one by Arjun Makajani, who is an American electrical and nuclear engineer who is president of the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research. As regards this bill, he said, it should not be allowed to pass even a Republican Congress. The argument is that this study is a waste of money. First of all, the National Academy of Science, NAS, already did this with Beer 7. Their terms of reference were less than 100 millisieverts, which is exactly what this bill says. NAS considered all hypotheses in Beer 7, hormesis, thresholds, linear no threshold. The science has not changed. Those who propose to spend money here should say why they think this would get a different result. Fukushima data are not in, and due to long latency periods for solid cancers, five to 60 years or more, will not be relevant, except maybe childhood leukemia. The EPA has already done a great deal of work in having its science advisory board go over Beer 7 to incorporate it into its work. That means EPA has also spent quite a bit of money. A repeat would mean a three-year process at the EPA and more money, again, to no purpose. The NAS is currently studying alpha radiation, mainly radon and its decay products. This affects millions of people. After low-level radiation, the NAS revisits alpha radiation and then low-level again? It is important to let the NAS proceed in a fashion that is protective on the radon issue, because millions of people are affected by that. Makajani concludes, In sum, this is a waste of money and compromises public health by preventing the radon update or sidelining it. And there is no reason to expect a different result. If passed, this bill implicitly impugns the integrity of the prior panel, which had very established radiation people on it. So using that information as a basis, it would behoove all of us to watch our newspapers and when anything comes up about this bill, post, write letters to the editor, see if you can get an op-ed in that reflects Makajani's extremely cogent argument. Considering that this bill has been welcomed, by the Washington, D.C.-based Nuclear Energy Institute, which is the nuclear industry's main trade group, and is being proposed by a Republican congressman who represents a district that includes the Department of Energy's Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, you've got to believe that it's not good news for those of us who oppose nuclear. So let's take steps early and often and make our perspective heard. John Stewart, shout out. John, while I'm in New York for Dr. Helen Caldicott's symposium, how about setting up a meeting for me with one of your producing staff? Give me five minutes and I promise to blow you away with nuclear numbnutsery that can enrich The Daily Show. So anyone who has any connections to John, or John, if you're hearing this, I'm a coming. Make some room. Let's talk. Here's today's final thought. I've established contact with a number of journalists around the world and maintain judiciously regular correspondence with them. I don't bug them. I make sure that when I do reach out, it counts. One of these whose connection I really prize is Martin Fackler, who is Tokyo bureau chief for the New York Times. I wrote him about two weeks ago asking him about any impact he's seen from the Japan State Secrecy Act, which was enacted as of last December 10th. I told him that I've seen many of my contacts in Japan dry up, and I suspected self-censorship as opposed to the government imposing itself as of yet. 
I found his answer brief but provocative. With Martin Fackler's permission, I quote, Dear Libby, Happy Year of the Sheep to you. I haven't felt an impact from the secrecy law, at least directly, but here in Tokyo there is almost no information about Fukushima these days. Just about zero. The reason is radiation has become an unpatriotic subject and thus a new media taboo here. The new law may have some impact on this, but the disappearance of Fukushima from public discourse precedes it. So radiation is now unpatriotic, and it's a new media taboo. So this is to my listeners in Japan. Is this what you have found to be the case as well? What insight might you be able to provide? If you are on the ground in Japan and can comment from first-hand experience, Facebook me or send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com and let me know what it looks like from your perspective. I will maintain privacy and confidentiality at least as best one can through online communications. Whether it's official government censorship or self-censorship based on fear, it's already impacting the news from Japan. Help me understand and help the other listeners of this show understand what there is to be learned about what's going on. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, January 13, 2015. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, Fukushima Diary, and our friend Iori Mochizuki, Yomiuri Shimbun, Fukushima Institute of Public Health, U.S. Department of Defense, Society for Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry, NHK, JapanTimes.com, RadioactiveEU.com, Asahi Shimbun, Oregonian, University of Washington School of Aquatic and Fishery Science, The Mayo Clinic, NaturalSociety.com, TheState.com, SafeEnergy.org, Nuclear-News.net, and the amazingly resilient and ever-on-key Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community. I invite you to join us, friend us. We are at over 1,000 friends and working our way to 2,000. You can also tweet to John Stewart or the Pope about us. Theme music for Nuclear Hot Seat was written by me and sung by Marilee Weaver. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV and is also available on AirProgressive.com. And I am very pleased to report that for the first time, we will be broadcast in a real FCC-based broadcast situation with KYAQ in Oregon. Woohoo! I'll let you know when that gets started. Meanwhile... If you're looking for back episodes, you can check on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, either the list that we have of the past 25, or you can search for something a little bit more esoteric and older. You can subscribe under podcasts on iTunes, and that is where you'll also find all of our episodes posted. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2015, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed to not-for-profit groups, blogs, and websites. You have my permission to reuse as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that you can and should tweet the Pope asking him to speak out against nuclear as part of his encyclical on climate change. You can do so by sending him a message at at pontifex. That's the mark A with pontiff and EX at the end. And once you've done that, remember that we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. So don't go back to sleep because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. 
nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb.